Inside Crime is brought to you by A Block Media, a full service consulting firm specializing in media relations training for law enforcement, custom videos, and podcast creation. Law enforcement professionals know A Block Media is a partner they can trust. I'm Angeline Hartman. I've spent my career as a journalist covering some of the most heinous and bizarre crimes in history. My craft is storytelling. My passion is crime fighting. With this podcast, I'm bringing you more stories, candid conversations with crime victims, their families, and law enforcement. We'll journey together as we learn what happens inside crime. Hi everyone, welcome to season two of Inside Crime. We're going to start off with a case out of Georgia, and I'm very excited to share this with you because this case truly needs your attention, and this one is close to my heart. At the center of this mystery is a young child. For too long, there've been no answers. On February 26, 1999, the skeletal remains of a little boy were found on the outskirts of Atlanta at a DeKalb County cemetery. It was a heartbreaking sight. He was wearing jeans, a long-sleeved shirt, and investigators all remember his cute little Timberland boots. I will never forget that day. I was at the crime scene too, covering the case as a reporter. No one knew how the child got there or how he died. To figure out his identity, cops followed leads all over the country. Eventually, the case grew cold. Over the years, they kept on trying. I did what I could as a local crime reporter to work with law enforcement and help generate attention. But still, the case remained unsolved. Several years later, I worked at America's Most Wanted and took the opportunity to bring national exposure to the case, but still nothing. Now I work at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and it turns out they've been supporting law enforcement on this case since 2002. Today, the National Center is releasing a brand new reconstruction image created from pictures of the child's skull. Over the years, I never forgot about this little boy. I always wanted to know what happened to him. Now, with Inside Crime, I'm able to bring you his story once again. In this podcast, we'll hear from the original investigators and reveal new details about this case. With your help, police hope they can finally give this child his name back. Let's start at the beginning. 20 years ago today. Do you remember how the call came in? Where were you and what you were doing? We, well, we were in the office and the call came from the uniform division letting us know that uh, a body had been found in a wooded area. And at the time, as I said, we didn't know exactly what it was other than uh, bodies don't just get there, so we needed to go and respond and, and, and work it as hard as we could. Pam Kuntz retired from the DeKalb County Police Department five years ago. In 1999, she was the commander of the Major Felony Unit, responsible for homicide and robbery investigations. It was... February, which in Atlanta could mean snow and ice or, or a decent day. And it was a decent day. It wasn't too cold. The way we worked homicides was when the call comes in, the entire unit responds. We throw as much manpower at it as we possibly can. Uh, when you work a homicide, uh, time is, of course, of the essence. So everybody rolls when the homicide call comes in. So the entire unit comes out. You have to maintain the integrity of the evidence. Uh, something like that, the forensic evidence could be of utmost importance. So, so we had to wait uh, and, and let the forensic technicians and let the medical examiner investigators do their jobs before we could really get in there. But we could see that it was a child, and that just immediately upped the ante of what the investigation was going to be. A young child, you could tell right away. 
Yes, you could see the the size of the shoes. You could see how his pant legs, you know, the bright red. You could see that it was obviously a small child. Who found the child? And let's talk about that. So the child was found by a man who was assisting in preparing a gravesite at the cemetery across the street uh, for a funeral that was coming. And uh, he walked into the woods and found the child, uh, ran out and told his coworker about it. And then they called 911. And of course, the uniform officers responded and uh, saw the child. And that's when the homicide unit became involved. It hurts my heart that there's a child that died and no one has missed this child. No one has come forward and said, you know what, I haven't seen my nephew. My nephew disappeared. Uh, the explanation they gave on where my nephew was, it just doesn't make sense. Or, you know, my next door neighbor's child isn't there anymore. Uh, I just, it's hard for me to fathom that no one missed this child. There's got to be somebody, right? Somebody has to be missing this child, whether if it's a family member, a, a, a neighbor, a friend, um, a teacher, a preschool teacher, anything that uh, someone slipped out of their lives and there either was no explanation or there was an explanation that just didn't quite make sense. Let's talk about what we know. So the medical examiner, of course, did the, an autopsy on the child. And over time, as more testing has been done, we've We've been able to determine that it's an African-American male child. He was probably between five and seven years old, anywhere from 45 to 60 pounds and somewhere between three foot 10 and four foot two. Um, he also had um, overcrowded teeth. Uh, so that might be something that someone remembers uh, that, the, that the child had, had, had a mouthful of teeth is how we like to say it down in the South. And I remember reading that, this is so heartbreaking to me to think about. Like, I, I remember reading that most of his teeth were still baby teeth. Yes, most of his teeth were baby teeth. That just gives you a real visual to think about a little boy with baby teeth, you know? He hasn't even had the tooth fairy come visit him yet. Right. Um, he's, he's just a little boy. Yeah. Um, let's talk about his clothing. So when we talk about the clothing... I can't to this day see someone wearing Timberland boots and not think of this child. And everybody I talk to remembers, oh, that's the kid, the kid with the Timberland boots. Right. This child, we know this child was loved and cared for. The child was dressed appropriately for the weather, for the winter. He had on a long sleeve uh, hoodie shirt. He had on blue, uh, red blue jeans. He had on the Timberland boots with socks. Um, you know, a lot of kids, when they get dressed, they conveniently forget their socks. Well, someone obviously made sure that this child was dressed right. And then someone helped him get ready because his shoes were double knotted. Uh, I think of the thousands of times I have done that for my own child before he could do it, where you tie the shoes and then you double knot them for safety for your child because you don't want them to trip and fall. As a mother, it's just what you do. Yeah. And I remember investigators made a big deal of that. Even back then, they said somebody cared for this child. We know somebody cared for this child because we're looking at these double knots, you know. <laughs> Kids don't care if their shoelaces are tied. Yeah. Parent, parents care. Parents care. And someone cared for that child. The day that child was placed there, that child had been cared for, um, which, again, goes to the whole mind-boggling thought of, then why don't we know who he is? Someone cared for him. So what's the theory, Pam? Why don't we know? Oh, gosh. Um uh, yeah, we, we could write a hundred lifetime movies on, on why we don't know who he is. Um, uh, it, it, it could be something as simple as the, the child passed away and uh, the, the, the parent or the guardian or whoever just mentally and emotionally wasn't able to handle it and just didn't know what to do, had, had just a breakdown, I guess, would be a, a way of saying it. Um, nothing sinister to it other than they're devastated by the loss of this child. I have one child. I can't imagine 
the shell of a person I would be if I lost my child. I, I, I just can't imagine it. A few weeks after the remains were discovered, the DeKalb County Medical Examiner's Office brought in a forensic artist from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. He created a clay reconstruction from the child's skull to help show what the little boy might have looked like in life. With plans to reveal the reconstruction at a press conference, investigators wanted to give the public a complete image of the child. So they attached the new reconstructed skull to a small mannequin dressed in clothing very similar to what the child was wearing when he was found. The child's actual clothing had degraded over time out in the woods, so the Emmy's office worked to create a match. I'm told that a lab supervisor there made the clothes herself. She found a shirt made out of the same plaid material at a flea market. Then for the shirt's hood and sleeves, which were a different thermal-like material, she dyed long underwear to match. She also bought red jean material and created that to fit the mannequin. Here's what investigators discovered about the child's clothing. His shirt and pants were last manufactured in 1995. That's four years before he was found. So investigators thought it might mean that the child was wearing hand-me-downs. They wondered, did the child have an older sibling or a relative? Investigators were also able to learn more about the child's new size 11 Timberland boots. Although they're sold nationwide now, back then those Timberland boots were introduced in Atlanta to test the market in June 1998. Remember, the child was found eight months later in February 1999. Also remember, investigators say he was likely in the woods for three to six months before he was discovered. At the press conference, because the little boy's boots were still in good condition, the Emmy's office used the child's actual boots to dress the mannequin for that press conference. It was the first time that DeKalb investigators created a three-dimensional figure of an entire body. When the image of that child was revealed in March 1999, it created a memorable impression for anyone who saw it. I remember um, watching the news and hearing the story kind of um, in the background. You know how you hear a story but don't really hear, but what caught my attention was the image that came up. But I remember the figure there on the screen, and um, that made me pause and pay attention to the story. Angie Wright Reeves just happened to be watching that day. She talked to me in 2014 as part of a story for the National Center on this case. Here's what she said. I just could not let that image go. I could not stop thinking about the child. I had every other reason to just move on because there was so much going on, but I could not let it go. Angie didn't have a connection to the case. She didn't even live in DeKalb County, but that didn't matter. So I was working at Atlanta Interfaith Broadcasters at the time, and I thought, what could we do? What better way to show the community, this child in a, in a sense, just everyone that children matter, he mattered, and what better way than the interfaith community coming together and saying, uh, let's do something to commemorate the life of this child. And so it started from there, just a mom with a new kid, my, my daughter was maybe a year old, just saying, I want to do something. I'd never done anything like this before. And uh, I was busy finishing up law school, had not a, no extra time or anything, but I absolutely had to do this. And that's how it began. And she told me how she worked quickly with her contacts to organize a special event that would bring together the community for a little boy no one knew. She reached out to local officials, coordinated with police, 
called the Atlanta Symphony for music and got support from all over Atlanta. We didn't know his religious background. We didn't know anything about him. So I thought that they all should claim him. You know, all of the faiths should claim this little boy. And what better way than to have like an interfaith memorial service to celebrate his life and the fact that he mattered. The cemetery where the child was found was on Clifton Springs Road, across the street from Clifton United Methodist Church. And that's where the community came together for an interfaith memorial service for a little boy without a name. What touched me so much during the service was the fact that we had a really nice turnout for a Thursday, <laughs> a Thursday afternoon. Maybe it was one or so, I don't remember exactly what time. But what struck me was that parents were bringing their kids. And so they had kept them out of school. And seeing these little kids there at the service uh, celebrating the life of this other child that they didn't know, but kind of claiming him. Everybody there claiming this child. And I just, um, it just felt right. It felt good. There, even though there were, were still no answers about who the child was or any answers about how he got there or the circumstances of his death, there still was some closure for that part. Investigators also attended the service that day, not only to take part in the event and show their respect, but also to see if anyone stood out, to find someone who might have a real connection to that little boy. It didn't happen, and investigators kept on working. They spent hundreds of man hours on the case and traveled all over the country tracking down leads. With the media attention, of course, there's phone calls. And some of the phone calls are, are crackpots calling in uh, to, to tell us that it's an alien child, things like that. But there were also uh, well-meaning people who called in and, and provided information on it could be this child. Um, the investigators at the police department, at the medical examiner's office, hunted all of those leads down and nothing has come to, to fruition. I know there's a lot that you can't talk about, but one of the most promising leads came in the same year that he was discovered. Right. About eight months later, the medical examiner's office received a phone call uh, from a woman who was very distraught on the phone who believed that she knew who the child was. Uh, and named him as uh, Cabell Brown. She said that he was abused by his parents and his family, but that he frequently traveled to Florida. I mean, that's crazy. Like, because that would fit. I mean, maybe that was a real scenario, right? Absolutely. It, it was valid enough that an investigator from the medical examiner's office and from the homicide unit, uh, we were able to trace the call. Investigators were able to trace that call, and to this day, that one phone call remains their strongest, most promising lead. Coming up next on Inside Crime. And she was genuinely upset at the time that she made the phone call. And she said, you know, like, oh my God, I know who this is. And she started giving me some details. What would cause a person to make a call like this several months after the body was discovered? you know, in a completely different state and give this information and, you know, in an emotional tone. I mean, that's, that's good information. For the first time, new details from the original investigators about that mysterious phone call. Now, 20 years later, could this be the lead that helps police get answers? That's coming up on the next episode of Inside Crime. Inside Crime is produced by A Block Media. For more information about this episode and to see the latest reconstruction images, check out our website, insidecrime.com. Feel free to drop me an email. I would love to hear from you. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Angeline Hartman. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode of Inside Crime. Mm -hmm.